Would you uh, give me your name, please? Richard Loki. And uh, do you go by Rick? Rich. Rich? Rich, where do you live? Um, Angels Camp, California. And what county is that in? Calaveras County. And are you in the trucking business? Yes, I am. How long have you been? Since 1996, and I'm um, taking over after my stepfather, who's been in it since the 60s. Okay, and what kind of trucking do you do? What do you, what do you haul? Haul mainly livestock or agricultural type commodities, as well as um, aggregate, um, low bed, flat bed, uh, for the construction, as, uh, as well as agriculture. Okay, how many trucks do you have? Just one. Uh, and is it uh, is it fitted for cattle hauling? Yes, it is. Hauling? Yes, it is. Okay, uh, that's what I want to direct your attention to, if I can, uh, today. Um, when do you when do you begin hauling cattle? On a normal season, you know, um, normally around the first part of April, and uh, we go clear through. Um, into the January of the following year. Okay, and where would you be hauling from normally uh, starting April 1st? April 1st in the springtime, we normally, um, I normally haul animals from California to Southern Oregon, Western Nevada. Uh, where in Southern Oregon? Um, Fort Klamath, uh, Klamath Falls, Beatty, Dairy, okay. Lakeview. And in Nevada? Nevada goes as, as far as east as Elko and I've hauled into uh, McDermott, Nevada, okay. Winnemucca, Nevada. Okay. When you haul into those states, do you come back empty? Normally, yes, in the springtime. Okay. And, uh, and how long do you haul from California into those areas? Normally a typical season, give or take, around 70 days straight. Okay. So that would be April, May, June? Yes. Uh, in the middle of June, maybe? Middle of June, and then um, normally after we get done hauling all the private um, ground, the cows to the private ground, we start, we come back home to Calaveras County and we start hauling animals, uh, local animals, to the mountains. Okay. And, uh, and those local animals going to the mountains, are they are they going from private land to private land? They're going from private private land to uh, Forest Service BLM okay. type allotments. All right, and and uh, uh, after that seventy days or so, uh, when you start hauling into California, then where do you haul from? When we start hauling into California, normally um, we normally start around middle to the end of October and we'll be hauling animals home. I've hauled animals uh, back into California from out of state as late as the end of January okay. of the following year. And where do you haul from, basically? Um, pretty much the same, uh, right? the return, return trip home from the, the spring. Okay. Uh, do you haul any from Idaho? I have hauled into Idaho, but very rarely come out of Idaho with animals. Because it's, by that time, it's pretty late to be yeah. getting out of Idaho. Yeah. Uh, where in Idaho have you hauled? Um, Simplot's feedlot there in Grandview, Idaho, okay. just outside of Marcin. Okay. The areas that you've talked about are, um, when, when you're hauling cattle out of there that have come off the public lands, it's either Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management, right? Correct. M mostly Forest Service. Okay. And uh, as I understand it, starting this year, the California Air Resources Board has put a restriction on when you can haul cattle in California. Correct. And what is that restriction? The restriction is uh, May 1st to June 15th. They're giving us a six week window to, um, they're basically telling us when we can move our animals in a non compliant truck. All right. And that's uh, uh, under. When I say non-compliant, I mean non-compliant to 2010 standards, but compliant to the rules that the state of California has implemented um, for us to use to make our older trucks legal right. to run. Uh, and then there's a second period. Second period is October 1 to November 15th. Okay. So from your standpoint, that's going to cut off a month of hauling 
uh, at least at the beginning, it's going to cut April off. It's going to cut April off and it's going to cut the rest of June and, and July off and it's not allowing us to market our calves like, like for us fall calvers. We normally sell our calves sometime in the first, first to middle of August right? and that's not allowing us to haul our calves from uh, where they're summering to the sale barns because we're outside our hauling dates. So from something that, uh, you know, I've worked with cattlemen for 20 years, 25 years now, um, in their battles against the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife and uh, Western Watersheds and everybody else. Someone like me, that, that, that doesn't, I, I, I can't see the sense in that. Can you tell me what's, what is the sense in fixing two six-week periods when cattle grazing and cattle raising doesn't allow itself to be fitted into those six weeks? In, in my true experience, it makes absolutely no sense for someone outside that really doesn't have the knowledge of our business, our operation, or what goes on in the ranching community to tell us what we can and can't do. Um, I've heard cattlemen, for example, and I've heard, I've heard uh, older cattle people uh, talk about how the government regulations that, that even BLM and Forest Service put on don't make any sense because cows don't live that way. Uh, this this to, seems to be even more restrictive than that. To follow up with what you're talking about, here's a good example. Back in the early 1900s, the last rancher out of the forest threw the match. Right. And if you look at when the Forest Service took over the forest, every year since they took over, the amount of acres burned per year has substantially increased. Yes. And the numbers of animals that they are allowing us to take into a forest is nowhere near what that forest could run if it was managed properly, or even with the state that it's in today, they're only allowing us to run a percentage below what it could actually hold. Right. Uh, last year, I had research done uh, regarding forest fires and the impact they have on air quality. Have you ever read any of those findings? Rim fire. Yeah. So that's up in my neck of the woods and I've seen firsthand the devastation because last year um, did a lot of building of logging roads so we can get the timber out. That is the worst devastation I've ever seen in my life with the amount of acres burned and just completely annihilated. It looks like somebody's just disking under a field but it's actually the forest. And what was the air like? Horrible. Horrible. It's uh... I live about, as the crow flies, about 20, 25 miles away and the smoke was so, so thick that anybody with any breathing ability, uh, disabilities was um, like my uh, mother-in-law that just passed away here last year. She had uh, COPD and, and uh, uh, some health issues. She was on oxygen and she couldn't even go outside for almost a month. Right. Now, you raise cattle as well as hauling. Yes. Right? And how many do you put, do you, is it uh, cow-calf? Yeah, cow-calf. And uh, now, along with the research that I was doing, we had a professor who testified that the forest fires in the state of Idaho in 2013 created more carbon in the air than all of the coal-fired power plants in the West. Can, can you believe that? Yes, I can. Uh, if you raise cattle and you've hauled cattle, you've seen more than just that one fire. That is correct. I've, I used to work for Cal Fire, so I've seen a lot of forest fires. Okay. I've seen hundreds of thousands of acres burned over the years. And when you look at these two six-week periods, 
one of the times, uh, you, you correct me now, I'm not, I don't want to be testifying, but I'm, I'm setting this to, to ask you if I'm right. One of the critical times for forest fires would be that time in August and September when you can't be hauling cattle. I 100% agree with you. Okay. August is normally the start. Like in Calaveras County, the last big fire we had was 1992, the old Goltz fire that burnt up a lot of homes and it started the first week of August. Okay. So have you figured out what this is going to cost you, what this, this regulation is gonna cost you? With the type of business that I do with my truck, I don't run the roads, I don't run 12 months out of the year, 365, because I got a family at home, I wanna be home with the family, and the trucking business, you're either away from home or you're home. But with the type of business we do, because the truck is used specifically for the, the ranching business, um, mm -hmm does not justify spending the $150,000 for the new truck to replace my 99 Peterbilt. Um, nor do I want to spend the 20000 to put the filter on it that is extremely detrimental to the longevity of that truck. That truck was built for 98 motor emissions by the feds, signed off, got the sticker on it that Carb wanted me to put on it. And in a carb ran meeting at Pleasant Grove Holt Brothers, they stated in the paperwork that they gave us that a 2007 or newer truck needed to blow less than 3% opacity. My 99 Peterbilt at the time that I did it had about 840,000 original miles on the motor. The only thing that ever been done to it is replace the cam blew a 2.7. So you were below what? I was below were. what they wanted without having the filter on it. But when I asked the CARB officials that were present that day, why won't my truck meet your standards? Because opacity is the only measurement you have for diesel smog emissions at this time. They says, because it doesn't have the filter on it. And I says, what does the filter do since my truck doesn't blow more than 3% opacity. And she says, it, she just kept reiterating herself, it doesn't have a filter on it. It doesn't have a filter on it. And so what, what that demonstrates uh, consistently with other things we've heard is that CARB has made up his mind regardless of the facts. Yes. And what they've made their mind up to is gonna be enforced regardless of the facts. To a point. The, the difference that I see with all the different rules is whoever blows their whistle the loudest and has the most money gets their way with the rules and regulations. And the people that don't stand up and fight for themselves get shoved to the curb and shoved out of business. Okay. Um, you pay attention to the rules that, that CARB puts out, the regulations, well, the amendments, and so on. I pay attention to a lot of the rules that come out normally in October and April, but it depends on what day and who you talk to in Sacramento when I make a phone call to the card people. And January of this year when I was trying to get some answers, question, uh, or some questions answered, they could not they put somebody on the phone that they brought over from a different department to answer a phone call to say that, oh, we had a call volume, but he could not answer my question and it took him over two weeks to get back to me to answer my question. And when they answered it, they didn't answer it to satisfaction. Uh, in other words, they didn't answer it to the point where it, it answered your question. They basically told me that this is, it's right there. It's on the truck and bus regulation website read it, understand it, and I, I'm saying this in my own words, but this is what I got out of it was, read it, know it, that's the law, that's what we're going by. And, and, is that, and was that discussion with regard to this final cattle truck regulation? We, well, it was in conjunction with the, um, uh, the cattle truck 
amendments as well as the construction amendments because I also, like I said, I, I do other agricultural outside work, like I said earlier with the hauling uh, uh, bottom dumping, you know, hauling aggregate to build logging roads to get the timber out of the woods. And because if I follow just the um, agriculture exemptions for hauling cattle, I cannot hook up to any other trailer. And then if I hook up to my belly dump, I got to fall under their 20,000 mile thing or I got to stay in a NOx exempt area. Well, when I haul cows, 20,000 miles is nothing. Because unfortunately with evolution and the Central Valley growing, all of the grazing ground is gone, been either um, built on or has gone into trees. So our area that we're having to cover to get cattle from our home country to green grass, summer pasture. Um, we're even talking about possibly even going down to Arizona this year because they've got water, they've got feed, which is probably gonna add another two to 300 miles in length per load to get them down there right. if we decide to go that far. All right, uh, but, but just from the standpoint of your regular work that you've done for how many years now in hauling cattle? I've done it personally myself since 1996, so about 19 years. But for that, you can't see the expenditure, making the expenditure that would be necessary for you to continue no. that, that type of haul. No. Uh, what about your other trucks? Uh, uh, how expensive is it going to be for you to operate your others? Uh, like my pickup? Yeah. Well, right now it's just a talk, but they're, they're talking about making us put it on our pickups as well. And right now, to my understanding, like I said, I don't have the paperwork in front of me, but I recall reading something that if you have a motor home that has a diesel engine in it, or you use your pickup for business, and I believe it's 10,001 pounds and greater, you have to, um, they got different rules. If you use it for work, it has to be small compliant, but the motor home people, the personal diesel pickup owners, they don't have to comply to any of this stuff. It seems to me, this is probably a pretty honest answer, is they're going after only businesses. Okay. I, I they're, was, they're leaving the personal people out of it. I and was, I think if, if you're going to go for one, you need to go for all because they all burn the same type of fuel and they put out the same type of smoke. And I, with the popularity of diesel pickups these days, there's probably just as many 16 year old kids running around in a diesel pickup as there were people that drove hot rod cars 20 years ago. Um, that was going to be one of my questions. You're, you're a smart guy and you've been, you've been in two very difficult uh, lines of work, cattle and, and trucking cattle. And uh, there's not a huge margin of profit in either one. You've no. got to be very efficient yes. uh, to, make, to make profit in either one. Uh, being an outsider from California, um, it, it would appear to me that, that, uh, that CARB has a goal of doing away with rural, particularly, diesel trucks and equipment. Or, or small businesses, let me put it that way, instead of rural, small businesses. The, the setting is already out there across the United States and the world for a corporation-ran country, and they basically want to expand it to around the world, and they, my honest opinion is they want to put all the little guys out so the corporations can take over, force all the little guys to go collect a paycheck so they can get your tax money right now, and we wouldn't be able to use the tax loopholes that these big corporations have already in place. Uh, you also, uh, being, being uh, uh, in the cattle business and, uh, and being in, in contact with people in Oregon and Nevada and Idaho, you know about Western Watersheds. Yes, I do. And John Marble. Yes. And you know that there isn't anybody uh, more determined to end livestock grazing on public lands than he is. Yes. 
doesn't it occur to you that when California puts this, these two six-week fixed periods for hauling cattle, that it is impetus to marvel to try to delay the turnout onto federal lands, both BLM and Forest Service, at both ends of the season? Yes. All right. Is there anything else? Uh, is there anything else about CARB and, and the impact on your life and the impact on the people in the trucking business that you know that you want to tell us? Well, is CARB has put a lot of stress, um, and I would probably say as far as destroying families because of the economic hardship that is putting on a lot of people. If if these laws, rules, regulations were put in place prior to 2008 when the economy crashed, they probably could have been absorbed much easier because the work was there. But unfortunately, with the current administration running this country right now, we don't have a booming economy like that they gloat that it's there. Um, it's pretty tough to find work, and I'm talking as a, a trucking community as a whole, there's a lot of people home sitting because the rates aren't there and the work's not there. Okay. If you do find work, the rates are far below what they should be that you're basically robbing Peter to pay Paul. And if you have to go to Arizona, if you, if you decide that you're going to stay at the cattle hauling business and you've got to go somewhere else, that's going to take you away from your family a lot. Yes. Uh, and that's part of what is your quality of life, is being with your family. That is exactly it, you know. Uh, are you familiar with any, any um, impact that, that the CARB requirements have on trucks that are owned by the state or by the public, uh, where, where public money is, extra public money is put in? Uh, to equipment because of these rules? First-hand experience, um, there's an entity, a public entity, that the aftermarket filter, and, and this was handed down through a memo from the hierarchies of the public entity, that the filter must be regen every eight hours. And that is pretty much and every Sunday occurrence. The truck right now doesn't get a lot of hours put on it, but the rule that's been put in place is every Sunday that filter needs to be regened. And there has been a regen machine bought specifically for this one truck. And, and do you know the cost of that machine? N not right off the top of my head, but if it's anything like the filters, it's not cheap. Well, and it's a pretty critical machine because, because what it ends up with is hazardous waste. Yes, ultimately. yes. I want to thank you for the time that you've taken because you're in two businesses that mean a lot to the agricultural community of California as well as the entire West. And I have a special interest in them because I'm from cattle country, from Owyhee County, Idaho. Uh, is there anything else that you want to add for the board to help them understand exactly what CARB is doing to your industry, both industries, with this regulation? Well, I'm not going to just sp speak on for just the cattle industry, but the trucking industry as a whole. It is economically ruining very well off businesses and creating, a, you know, like I said, a, a, an economic hardship as well as um, destroying a lot of years of growth and, you know, blood, tears, and sweat that people have built a business up to. And then all of a sudden, one entity from the state of California comes in and says, these are the rules, you will comply or get out of business. Rich, thank you very much for testifying and, and bringing this information to the board. Thank you. Thank you.